Good afternoon. I am Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, Barbara Rabin, Chief Education Officer at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I would like to thank you for joining us for this fifth installment of our 2021 Summer Survivor Speaker Series. Today, you will hear from Mr. Max Glauben, a Warsaw Ghetto survivor whose family was murdered during the Holocaust. Max survived the Holocaust and went on to help found the Dallas Memorial Center for Holocaust Studies, the precursor of today's museum. And Max is, of course, still very active with the museum today. Max will share his experiences with you this afternoon. He was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1928. Soon after the Nazis invaded Poland, Max and his family were confined to the Warsaw Ghetto. In 1943, after the ghetto uprising was crushed by the Nazis, he and his family were deported to Majdanek. Max survived several concentration camps before being liberated in 1945 by members of Patton's Third Army while on a death march. Max eventually settled in Dallas. Before we begin, I would like to thank our community partners for the Summer Survivor Speaker Series, Christo Ray Dallas, Jewish Family Service of Greater Dallas, Legacy Senior Communities, Mosaic Family Services, Refugee Services of Texas, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission. We are extremely grateful for your support as it makes this program possible. So today, Max will share his story with you and then we will have time for questions and answers. To ask him a question, please click on the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen and type in your question. And now I give you Max. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for tuning in to our beacon of education to eliminate hate and bigotry, and also to make this a better world that we could live in or our families could live in. I will try to <clears throat> relate to you what a person that lived in Europe and the 30s went through and was able to survive only by his determination to turn in the bad things into good. I was born in Warsaw, Poland, to a family, a modest family. My father was a part owner or owned at the, that age. I was about 11 or 12 and didn't know if he owned it or whether he was a part owner of a Jewish publication that was uh, distributed all over Europe. And uh, we lived in a nice apartment I had a little brother, and of course, uh, uh, my father was married, so there was a uh, uh, mom involved. And we didn't lack for anything. We were Jewish, but not orthodox but there was a new a wave of uh, uh, religious belief that was called a goodist where some of the appearance uh, ways were waived like a real orthodox might have long sideburns and uh, wore certain attire uh, daily with fringes on uh, and some of that was dropped. But anyways, 
I went to a regular school so that my little brother, we didn't lack of everything. Came September 1st, unannounced after uh, assurance by a person that's, his name starts with an H, uh, met with uh, a British uh, ambassador and assured him that no war would be uh, inside uh, Germany simultaneously with Russia overthrew the German government. It was done by a blitzkrieg, a lightning way of taking over territory through bombing, destroying everything, then marching in with their tanks and troops. Thus, the war started at September 1st, around October, tanks and aircraft bombing the aircraft left leaflets for the people and for the army to surrender. Warsaw was taken over. The amount of structures left was about 15% after the bombing, making life very impossible under these conditions. When Germany entered immediately, any right that we as a family and other members of the Jewish religion were not available to us by first, if you were a Jewish person, you had to register. Disclose items that you wouldn't if you lived in a free society and had the right to do so. We were told and uh, there were announcement of many things, many provisions that we shouldn't and couldn't own any property. Some of the people that were attorneys and teachers and other professional people could not practice their profession to the public at large and possibly could do it within the area where the Jewish people were. The stores were blocked, the ones that were still standing, and people that were not Jewish were discouraged by the gendarmes from coming in and doing business with Jewish people. I'm not gonna dwell too much of it because I think that people get an idea of what kind of life. To describe it better, no electricity, and if gas was available, and any utilities that are necessary to maintain life were sometimes not available. Now, you cannot say everywhere, but in most of the places, because if a bomb was dropped in one part of an apartment complex, the water had to be cut off because it would be leaking and there wouldn't be a bomb. 
We had a shortage of water. We had a shortage of food. If a Jew later on lived in the ghetto, was allowed 84 calories a day, you can imagine how much food we were getting. But I'll talk about that a little bit later. We lived like that for maybe a month or so. Then immediately the Germans announced that a certain area next to the Warsaw Cemetery is going to become a ghetto. And it was approximately a one square mile area. And the walls are going to be built by the Jews that live in that area. And uh, they're going to have to provide anything that's necessary to building the wall. Well, it happened. We started building the wall, which means that we became masons. And many people perished building the wall because not everybody is apt to, to know how to do or how to build or whatever. We started in 1939 and the ghetto was finished in 1940. During the process of building that one square mile that was called the Warsaw Ghetto, the conditions were so horrible. We drank water that was rainwater gathered by gutters and big drums. And yes, at the beginning, it was heaven that supplied our water and that was snow. You can fill up your utensils with clear rainwater, and then put it into a bathtub or a sink that wasn't functioning by the faucet. And that was your supply of water as much as you can get it. Because of the conditions, a typhoid epidemic occurred. The ghetto was quarantined. The Germans not allowed to come into that area and supervise the building of the ghetto. Thus, a city council appointed by the Germans, then they were ordered to appoint 2,000 Jewish policemen to operate the doings in the ghetto under the German command. And in order to save their lives and the family lives, and some of them didn't want to volunteer for that, they had to become horrible to their own families and the all members of friendship or friends. The, the ghetto was finished and all, all, all the Jews that lived in the area where the ghetto was and built it maintained their apartments and their belongings. Then came a memorandum that all the Jews that live in the Warsaw area and around its suburbs have 
to be placed in that ghetto forcefully if they don't do it voluntarily. The only thing they could take with them was what they can carry on their person. And imagine it was winter time when it was finished. So you don't know what to take and how to take. Anyways, by the time all the people were crammed into the one square mile with 2,400 apartments, there was a half a million, approximately a half a million people in that area. Each apartment became a dungeon with maybe 20 to 21 people. And it may not be as much as an apartment, but sometimes there were that many people in a room because there was no assigned apartments. So it was like free, free base of getting into it. And that daily, the Germans would come in and gather the people in the square of their apartments and sometimes mess with them in horrible ways and sometimes pick up details for some work to be done in Warsaw, either on the outside of the ghetto or inside of the ghetto by cleaning the streets and maybe helping some of the German quarters with uh, cleaning and cooking and whatever was involved. We lived under horrible conditions from 1940 through 41, 42, 43. I said that simultaneously, Poland was invaded by Germany and Russia. When they entered into Poland, Germany took the Western part, Russia took the Eastern part. Then they signed a non-agreement that Germany broke about a year later, about 1940 or 41. And I may not be accurate on it, but I'm doing it from memory. And there were, when this happened, Germany went up all the way to Stalingrad and bedded down and tried to take it over. But were very unsuccessful. And on the front in Africa, the same thing happened. Problems with occupation. So they decided to enforce the final solution. Thus, every Jew in the occupied territory in Poland of German occupied by Germany in Poland became a candidate for the gas chambers. If he could be caught, many of us survived by either becoming smugglers or evading the Germans or becoming bar not bartending, but bartering, exchanging for food or doing many things to survive because regardless how bad things are, you can always do something. When 
the enforcement of the final solution was, then people started being picked up, taken to a gathering place called an Umschlagplatz and loaded on boxcars and trains that usually took from one, two, three to five days to reach the destination from Warsaw of two places, Treblinka and Majdanek. And these were destruction places where they were gassed and with carbon monoxide and later on with gas and the bodies cremated. They were taken up in 1943, at the beginning of the year, up to 5,000 people from Warsaw Ghetto were placed on boxcars, at least 100 on each one, and rode all the way to Treblinka and Majdanek and uh, The ones that were taken, the, the 5,000 that were taken in that way were offloaded and then there were not enough Germans to supervise them. So many of them escaped, went back to Poland because they still had families, warned the underground Thus, the trained underground that wanted to resist the German did so on April the 19th of 1943. The resistance lasted till about end of May and maybe a little bit later, and I cannot talk about that, but The only way the Germans could uh, occupy the ghetto was by bringing in napalm flamethrowers and burning the ghetto completely. Anybody above ground perished. The rubbish fell on the basements and we used the basements as bomb shelters, but converted them for hiding places. Thus, some of the places became grave sites, but lucky to people that were in places that were better insulated, thus were being able to survive. When the final solution was declared, and they were really looking for Jewish people. Then after it kind of cooled off, they discovered my family after an informer or whatever, in a basement like that, they were not gonna help us get out in a normal way like digging up, but there was a hand grenade thrown in and an opening made. And then they took us out, took us to the Umschlagplatz. And this was for the final ride. Instead of Treblinka, our train, for some reason, went to Majdanek, which was a newly converted gas chamber, dead camp. When we arrived there, I looked through the little, peeped through the little window and it said Lublin. So I thought all the time I was in Majdanek that I was in Lublin, but it, Majdanek was a suburb of Lublin. 
we were offloaded, then lined up five abreast. When the Germans realized that we were all in five abreast, they set up checkpoints to the entrance of the camp with evidently requisitions for able bodies for labor concentration camps. And then there was a line that would be going in to the gas chamber area. The procession began, women and children first, immediately, without any warning, I lost my family, my mom and my little brother who are in front of us and some of my relatives. I was behind my mom and my little brother and my relatives next to my father. He held my hand and as a child, I wanted to proceed behind my mom. He says, stay with me and the Germans allowed it. And as we started marching, they pulled them to the side, put us to the side of the road, face down, lying down. And we were selected or my father was selected for one of the work camps. We stayed in Majdanek for any length of time and under situation like that, you don't remember how long, but then placed on another train and taken to Budzin. Budzin was a horrible camp run by a Obersharfira fights next to an aeroplane factory. And I immediately uh, started to work in the carpenter shop there. The process at Buzin was we got up in the morning and were counted on a appel square. Then the commander, Fikes, would come out on a white horse and receive the count of many buildings that were in that camp, maybe three or 4,000 people. Then he ride the horse in the back of our standing to the middle of the thing and single out single people for destruction and threatening us that we didn't behave and do the work that was for us, we would end up the same way. After that, we would march into the private factory, aeroplane factory, Heinkel, and later on Messerschmitt, American, uh, German aircraft. While we were marching, we had to sing and keep cadence. If some people didn't do it, they never survive or reach the destination. Food, one slice of bread a day and one bowl of soup a day. When I say a bowl, sometimes you didn't have a right container to obtain the soup. So if you have a hat, you sometimes put it in your head. We in these factories that we worked as carpenters or structural working had access to utensils that were not meant for food, but maybe containers that held certain items so we could always obtain something 
to have the soup there. I worked in that camp for maybe like two or three weeks. And we went out singing to the section that we were working so we wouldn't create any disorder in the factory. We were being counted as a head count when we went out. When we came in in the evening, there were three people missing. Thus, the Germans took 10 hostages for all any person that was missing. My father became a hostage. I was next to him, but they let me or pushed me into the barracks and took him for a hostage, laid him out with a face down on the ground in the middle of the Appel Square. And it was a Friday night when I got up Saturday morning. Only shoes were left from the people that lied the evening before and disappeared overnight. So I didn't even know how he was killed, but I was orphaned on that Friday. And uh, I didn't want to give him satisfaction that they were hurting me. And I always thought I was a strong believer in God and uh, in our religion, if you save one life, it's the same that if you would save the whole world. And even though at that age, I, I felt like my life was being denied. It's like a child has been denied a toy and he'll do anything to get it. And uh, I was many mechanically inclined, I can perform what they wanted me to perform, even though my performance would help the war, but it was saving my life. By being able to do it properly, the, the, I later find out hindsight, that the camps were being closed. So first, I was in Buzin. I was transferred to Mielitz, not knowing that Buzin was being closed. So we had people from Mielitz and Buzin in there. So it became kind of tight, but if you were good, they still kept you. But if you were bad, they didn't have any quarters for you. There was no place where to sleep. There was no food where to eat. So they would dispose with some of the people, send them out maybe to different camps or whatever. I stayed there for a while. Then I was transferred to Vielitschka because Mielec was being closed. By the time we went to Vielitschka, there were so many people that there were fields of bodies because some of the people that were in Mielitz and got there were malnutrition and other things and uh, was pretty bad. But evidently they wanted to get rid of everybody out of Vielitschka. So they put us on boxcars to Auschwitz Birkenau. When we got there, they tried to open the doors, but they wouldn't let us down because the tracks were full of trains brought from all the places that they were closing because the armies were advancing and taking over the territory that they occupied. They closed the doors and we were taken to Plashov, which was the camp that was run by Schindler's List, you know, that, that was in a movie. 
when we got to Shinda's list, bad things happened. So on the eighth month of 1944, we were taken as a first Jewish transport to Flossenburg, Germany, into an international camp and everybody was there. And I might say that the conditions were not any better than in the other camps, but most of the people were involved in manufacturing and the ration supply and the treatment was maybe a little bit better because the people were professionals that were running the camps on that. I stayed there till April the 16th of 1945. In the middle of the night, the lights go on and we hear a couple of shots. All the Jews fall out. We were gathered outside on the Appel Square, placed on a train into boxcars with Germans in the doorways. And the conditions were so bad that they didn't close the doors. So the Germans were visible standing in the doorways. The train leaves and Allied planes shoot them up twice. The second time, the Allied planes thought that it was German soldiers. The second time, the German soldiers run out of the cars. So do we. And the train is destroyed. Thus, we go on a dead march, marching at night and being placed into the woods of forest at dusk. So reconnaissance planes that are flying around wouldn't see what action is on the ground. We march from the 16th of April until April the 23rd, where we come into a place, and I believe it was a Sunday. So they had us in front of a church. We saw people going to the church. Then they put us on a little hill, surrounded us with machine guns, and told us, stay there. We stayed there, and in the middle of the day, we hear a roar of heavy equipment other than aircraft engines. About seven of eight of us youngsters that survived the march, and there were not too many of us left, tested our ability to run down this hill and scatter and maybe we wouldn't be killed by the machine guns to find out what the roar of the engines was. Well, we did it and the machine guns were abandoned because the, the roar was of American tanks of the Third Army. We liberate it. We scream up to the people on the hill, come on down, we liberate it. Then we start knocking on German doors for food and maybe shelter. We are not being allowed to enter the homes. They might open the door and give us something, but 
so you couldn't come in there for fear of what we might do to them. Well, the, f the few youngest ones that were the ones that went down there, we found one home that we knocked on the door. The lady let us in and fed us. I slept on the floor, but in the next morning, she told us, you must leave because my neighbors are going to do harm to me for allowing you to come into my home. So anyways, we went outside and there were always, the area was being occupied by Americans. So there were always soldiers that were still going through in tanks. And we were told to start marching and finding out where the Americans would make a displaced person camp that we could survive or live. As we were doing that, behind us, we were on a farm road. Behind us came the 179 signal repair call of the US Army. And he asked us where we were going. And I told him, and he said, I don't think that you are in a condition to try to find out where it was. He gave us uniform, uniforms, American uniforms. And he says, don't say anything. And made us his helpers. We roamed with him until we hit Nuremberg, Germany, took over a caserne that was abandoned by the Germans, that was a city within a city. They were assigned some German POWs to that and Polish guards that were guarding him. And I became a mess sergeant. And I was there for two years, learn how to drive, cook, speak English, run a projector, dance, smoke cigarettes, and eat candy, and barter with candy. Anyways, came 1947, I realized that I can apply to, for entry to the United States under the Children's US Act. And I registered, I was placed in an orphanage in Germany in a Glasterhausen went to the council and was lucky enough to go with some babies. The council said, I want this group in the United States right away. Two months later, I was, I landed in New York on December 13th, 1947. I was placed in an orphanage in New York. I didn't like it. December 31st, 1947, I was placed in a foster home in Atlanta, Georgia. I thought it was a private home with a Miss Rosenthal that was very nice and kept me up. But it was the children service, Jewish children service that took care of me from there. I stayed there for a few weeks and then I got a job and job, job, job. And uh, some families let me live with them. And uh, I was very appreciative, but uh, I, would, I made an attempt to go to school and I couldn't do school and uh, sustain life because I didn't have any family. So I had odd jobs. I, in 1948, that's a year later, I was asked and I was eligible for the draft so I registered for the draft. Then in 1951, 
I was drafted into the United States Army and I was trained in Fort Hood, would come in to Dallas where there was another family, the Fair family that adopted me. So on weekends I would come in here when I met my wife. I stayed on active duty for two years. I became an honor student in the food service. So I became a mess sergeant in the 702nd Armored Infantry Battalion of the 1st Armored Division. I, when I got out after two years of service, I had to serve three years of inactive duty. When I was coming in to Dallas from Fort Hood, that's where I met my wife. And when I got out in 53, I decided to marry. I have uh, three children, seven grandchildren, and three great-grandchildren. I live in Dallas since the 50s, and uh, I had an ambition of devoting my life thanking for what happened to me through orphanages, foster homes, and people like Jewish Children's Service that were providing for me. But once I was able to work, I always compensated them as much as I could for what they were doing where compensation was necessary. So thus I became a nonprofit and I created a trust or a foundation. And as a result, I turned to educating people about the Holocaust and trying to eliminate through education some of the hatred and bigotry, what was happening and trying to make this a better world. I made 14 trips back to Europe with approximately maybe 15 to 20,000 students a year I made seven trips to Germany, spoke in Germany there, and visited all the horrible places to enhance the education on stages without any scenery, people like us, and like now talking about the Holocaust, but not having any feelings of what it is like to be in a room where people were dying by gassing or watching an oven that burned human bodies. So we're coming now to the end of my speech and I hope that I covered everything as much as I could from A to the end and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Max, as always, for sharing your story. Again, if, if you have questions, please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen to type those out and submit them. Uh, we'll start here, Max. You just mentioned uh, the many trips you've taken back to Poland with March of the Living. Do you remember what it was like the first time you went back? What did that feel like? The first time that I went back, my wife went with me, and I just came back from Israel where I found one of my uncles that was looking for me 
but couldn't, I was not available and I was in, with the army and not in a displaced space camp. So I was well aware because there were some people there that were in the camps. But when I went back, I had horrible feelings. But there again, with my attitude, I took a look of what response there was from the students. They became more humane. They had tears in their eyes. Some of them were more religious. And it was a life-changing experiment for them. And when I came back, the parents saw the change in them. So I decided, I was asked immediately to go on another trip. But I decided to take the role of a teacher or an actor that eliminates himself from what happened to me and becomes a speaker of what happened to me. Do you understand? Certain places where my family died were tear, you know, tear marking uh, ceremonies. But the other things was a description of what I did and it became like a lecturer, like I'm doing now when I went there, but it had so much more meaning that you didn't have to explain that much, but everything was visible. And it also made all of these people witnesses because when they saw that, there's no way of denying it. Thank you, Max. And did, I know you've been telling your story for a long time now. Did you, were you open about your experiences right after the war or how long did it take you to feel comfortable telling this story? Well, I had some uh, nice positions where I was working. I was working a buyer, as a buyer at Neiman Marcus in the late 50s, right after I got out of the service. And I wouldn't speak about the Holocaust because people didn't believe it or whatever. And uh, after I got married, then I had children and I had grandchildren. But while I was at Demons, some people asked me and I started speaking in churches. And then I started speaking in schools. And uh, sometimes when I spoke, I don't think that I saw belief in the eyes of the people that I spoke to. So we were kind of discouraged. But then we spoke in the synagogues to the people that lived, you know, in the United States. So I would say that in the 70s, I went into full speed and spoke in schools, but I also had a business, so I would run a business, but I would speak in Sunday schools, in churches, and then on the Sabbath. So I've been speaking for a long time and uh, also trying to build this magnificent beacon that is really promoting 
freedom and teaching people of how to become humane and eliminate bigotry and hatred. And we're very happy to have you doing that with us, Max. We have a question from Christopher, who is 14, who is watching today, um, who's asking, did the Holocaust cause you to have any fears that you still carry with you today or that were especially hard to get over? Well, not only fears, but first, you can talk about pain that cannot be duplicated. Fears were at the beginning because if I saw a policeman, I would try to go across the street or cross the street away from the policeman and I would fear to express myself, you know, in the public. The other thing is that fear is a, is a hard I, feeling that comes back in your sleep. So this is why it was hard for me to express. Now, I'll be speaking right now, and it's 70 some years ago. And I'll go home and I'll sleep and I'll be dreaming about something that happened 70 years ago. And I think that I may have to escape and I could escape and I try to escape and I can't go anywhere, you know? And that's a horrible thing and sometimes you would wake up. But the, the greatest th influence that you get some kind of a brain washing. Now listen carefully and it's not bad and it's like anything else. When you live for about four or five years without being able to eat when you are hungry, but you eat when food is available, you become brainwashed to act that way sometimes and might overindulge with the food for fear that you might not have it for the next meal, right? If you cannot go to a bathroom when you need to, and you have to hold it until you can go when they tell you to, you might do it for the rest of your life if you're in certain situations. Now, they may be good or bad. <laughs> I know that. And all these things I consider that were, you know, kind of built into you. If you might eat with your mouth open, not in a proper way, because you ate like an animal, and sometimes you might sit at a table and instead of eating with a fork and a knife, you might grab something by hand, like I'll eat chicken like that, and I don't find it nutty, you know. I had strawberries today, I ate them with my fingers. There are certain things that happen that it's like a child is being taught to grow up. We were being denied of the normal ways of life. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Max. Um, and we have a lot of questions today. I'm sorry, we won't be able to get to all of them. We'll do two more, if that's okay with you, Max. 
Um, so one question, you mentioned your mother and brother and other relatives were, were killed in the gas chambers at Majdanek. How long did it take you to learn what happened to them? And how did you find out after the war? Well, to start with, there's never closure. The only way I found out about it was in 1984 or 85. Two of my father's sisters survived Majdanek, unknown to me, and they were sent from Majdanek, stayed there for a while, to a munition factory in Germany, and they found me here in Dallas 42 years after the Holocaust. So we had a reunion. And the only thing that I found out that my brother got lost because we were treated like animals. And, you know, like sometimes, God forbid, you see a theater and something happens and people run out or like a football game and people are stumbled. So I don't know if he died that way or any other way. But my mom was taken to a dispensary that was really a dead chamber. They disposed of the people that went to a medical dispensary. But they told me that they put it on a truck because if you don't eat properly, your eyes closed. And she could hardly keep her eyes open from the lack of food. So they took her away. She couldn't do any work. So that's how she perished and more in the dispensary. And I don't know whether they took it to the crematorium or what. Now with my brother, I make a lot of Zooms and I recently made a Zoom with somebody in Germany that has all the records that were made of me and all the other Holocaust survivors and I befriended her. So I got all my records for the second time. And she asked me if I knew what happened to my brother. I said, no. So right now, my brother's name is in the Red Cross in Poland and in Germany. And they might have taken it off, trying to find it of whether he's still alive, maybe escaped, changed his name or whatever. But if there's no closure, I asked her to put the name in again, because consider this, there's a German that's a nice person and he's doing this and he's married and he doesn't, his wife and he cannot have any children. They're infertile. Do you think that many of them that saw a beautiful Jewish child could not pick it up and raise it, change the name, and of course, assign them to the religion that they are? Do you understand what I'm saying? So that type of thinking had me put it in into the Red Cross again, even after 75 years, but there's no hope for it now. He disappeared. But you see what goes through your mind that some things like that could happen because there are good people in the world too. All right, Max, we'll end on this one. How did you keep your faith 
during this terrible time? First, I mentioned that already, that if you save one person in our religion is the same as if you save the whole world. As a child, I always said, when I went into the synagogue and I prayed, I wonder why I cannot say my prayers. Why do I have to read something that somebody else wrote? But anyways, embedded in me what a love of God because I had everything and evidently I must have been selected to survive and not to perish. And maybe I was left to do what I'm doing right now, but more than ever, I would always pray. And after my parents were gone, I would really talk to them or to her, I don't know who. And in my mind, like maybe on Fiddle on the Roof, does she love me or does she not love me? And I made many decisions talking like that. And sometimes I was in a situation that was real bad and you pray. And just like you take an average person, if something happens or you say to them something, what is it do you get out of them out? Oh my God. Do you see? So even if they don't believe, there must be some kind of a present of God in him to say that. And I may say many prayers. And my thought was, a lot of people lost faith because where was God when this was happening? God was in the same place. He is now. And the world is not the same, but it's still here. And God wasn't doing these things, but human beings were doing it to human beings. And as long as my prayers of my survival survived, I'm still here then I believe that there is a superior power. Or furthermore, maybe the souls of the departed are looking over me and many other people. So they live and tell the story of the Holocaust to the population at large. Thank you, Max. And thank you as always for sharing your story with us. If you're joining us today, we hope you'll join us for more sessions in this series, which runs every Tuesday through August 10th. Uh, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Max, and everyone have a great rest of your day. Thank you.